can change the world. So let's go. We can do it. Matter of fact, we will. Yes, sir. This world bleeding in my God can heal. Yes, sir. Every time when I'm out in the field, the heartbeat from the people saying, we some real. Let's go. Man, we can change the world. We can. Got to do it for the boys and girls. The future. God has a sentence for your life. He sends you out to spread light. Like, so we, we, we can change the world. Yes, sir. We can change the world. Hey everybody, how you doing? New John Simmons here on the Testimony House Network. So thankful you've joined us on the program. This is a show called Tell Me Your Story, where we tell the story of God's people out in the world. Today on today's episode, we're talking to Miss Kristen from the Real and Redeemed podcast and YouTube channel. Her and her husband James have struggled and overcome issues with pornography and sexual sin. Today, though, they are on a mission to create awareness around these and other topical issues on their podcast and YouTube channel, here to take us on her journey of her life in Christ, sickness and healing, and her desire to share biblical insight with others through her online ministry is Kristen James. Kristen, how are you doing? Hi, I'm good. How are you? I am doing so wonderful. I'm so glad you joined us on the show today. Uh, you have a wonderful story, and we're going to dump right into it. And it sort of starts with you being raised in a house that wasn't really godly, but you guys were just sort of cruising along, and you had some issues with uh, a father who was uh, had some alcohol abuse stories, and we ran into some issues there. But so you sort of start us off in your journey of what it was like uh, early in your life. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Okay, so yeah, I grew up in a home that just – really didn't talk about Christ at all. Um, I made my communion when I was in like third grade and then I was baptized in the Catholic church. But then after that, I really just didn't go to church. Um, I would go like with relatives and stuff here and there. Um, some of my extended family is like Catholic and stuff. Um, so I would go with them sometimes, but, um, besides that, I really didn't go to church. So yeah. that's kind of my little story with like growing up in church, I guess, is I didn't. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, I grew up in a house where it wasn't, I mean, I guess when you hear like broken home, you think of like a divorced, you know, parent group, but they, right. um, my parents weren't divorced. Um, but they definitely weren't in love. And so I grew up just looking at a marriage that was very um, unhealthy and toxic and just one that I knew that I couldn't look up to, one that I knew I didn't want um, yeah. when I got older. Um, my dad, yeah, he did. He works for a um, like alcohol distributing company. So basically part of his job was to taste wine and go to all these mm. like dinners and events. And um, yeah, that definitely led him down a road of alcohol abuse. Um, there were times where he wouldn't come home and there were times where I would like wake up in the morning to go to school. And um, uh, this happened like two or three times maybe that his like car was smashed in. So mm. I'm not sure exactly, but I'm pretty sure it was from like a drunk driving Whoa. episode type of thing. So, yeah. So that was definitely um, really hard growing up because I was like a total daddy's girl. And to just mm. be like looking out the window, like wondering where your dad is, wondering if he's going to come home. That was definitely very difficult. So, yes. Yeah. In <laughs> um, the sixth grade, you found out that he was maybe uh, running around on your mom a little bit or something, right? Yeah. So yes, when I was in sixth grade, um, he, I actually, <laughs> he would, so at that time I was getting bullied. So he had like a work friend, which turned out not to be a friend. Um, mm. so he had a work lady friend who lived in the back of our subdivision and she had a son that was my age. And so he would, um, take me over to their house and we would like hang out together or whatever and actually the son and i didn't get along at all the son actually started bullying me as well so like that didn't really go as planned for him <laughs> um <laughs> but yeah so um we actually went on vacation with them which my mom did not come on those vacations um and yeah like his um, not only the lady, but her husband, she was also married. Um, he was like on the vacations too. So it was not very good, but she um, and him, my dad ended up having an affair. And I 
I'm honestly, because I was so young, I was only like 11, so I was like not disclosed every little detail, but it was probably going on for like a year or two, and then my dad finally like admitted it to my mom, and yeah, it was not a good time in our family, yeah. that is for certain, so. The reason I'm, we're even bringing this up, because we're telling the story of your life, and we're going to get to the parts where you struggle with sin issues after you became a Christian, but I think this this story beforehand really sets the table for what, you know, your heart was like and puts you in a place, and so you see this stuff happening with your dad, and you describe sort of family being normal, but it was also chaotic. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, because I think that everything leading up to me meeting Jesus, like, I can look back now and I'm like, oh, like the Lord is really going to use that specific situation like in the future or like right now, like my testimony with pornography that I'll share in like a little bit and stuff like that. Um, I do think that before you meet Jesus, like he uses all of those broken parts of your past to like bring him glory. So yeah, I'm definitely excited to be sharing all of this. But um, yeah, my home was definitely very chaotic. I did not want to be there like ever. Um, which led me to when I got a boyfriend and um, I was in 10th grade. That became like everything to yeah. me. Like that was young love. It. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And so, um, yeah. So my, well, backtracking a little bit, my parents started to go through the divorce process. Um, they, it was just very hard because I was young. My sister was like six years older than me. So at this time, she was like almost graduating high school. She was like 17. And so, um, you know, they would ask me questions like, whose house would you want to live at and blah, blah, blah. And um, it was really hard because I felt like I was being pulled in like two different directions. And like, no matter what I said, I would upset someone because I honestly grew up a total daddy's girl. Like yeah. I was my like I was best friends with my dad so um that was definitely a very difficult time for me because your dad's supposed to be a person that you can trust and that you can rely on and obviously like with him I was kind of like I mean not unknowingly I was kind of involved in his affair so it was just very like a big trust issue um and then yeah my parents were like always fighting they didn't end up getting a divorce um they ended up staying together and it was very, uh, I don't want to say like they should have gotten a divorce because like mm -hmm. obviously divorce is yeah. not ideal. Um, but yeah, it was just, it made it like everything like way worse because they never had like the most amazing marriage to look up to. But then after that, especially, it was just kind of like, all right, I won't ever want to be home for sure. So yeah. Um, so when I got a boyfriend in 10th grade, um, I was like with him all the time um within like three months i lost my virginity to him because you know i thought i was like gonna stay with him forever and everything and all that jazz which obviously that just didn't work out <laughs> thank god actually <laughs> um but yeah so i was with him and um i can kind of explain this a little bit now i guess but he watched porn um and that's, I remember that being the first time I ever really heard about porn. Like, I was, I was, I don't want to call myself innocent because I really, like, wasn't super innocent as, like, mm -hmm. a high schooler. Right. But I wasn't, I, I don't know, I guess I wasn't exposed to as much. Like, I mean, in my high school, like, only, like, the popular kids drank and the popular oh, kids, yeah. like, did stuff like that. So, and, like, had sex even. So, it was, like, weird to all my friends that I had had sex and, like, I had lost my virginity because, mm -hmm. like, all my friends were, like, these sweet little, like, drama mm -hmm. and theater people and, like, band nerds in a nice way. I love band people. <laughs> they were, like, proud of their band nerdness. It was great. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so I was, like, the weird one who was, like, rebelling, but it was, like, oh, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I was 16, so I'm, like, I don't know. But fairly common now, unfortunately. But yeah, so I lost my virginity to him, and then he talked about how he watched porn, and I remember it bothering me, but I remember I was like, oh, like, he's like, well, you're not bothered by it, right? Because it's just people on a screen, and like, it's not like I'm cheating on you. And I was like, yeah, yeah, for sure. And so I hmm. I don't even think I understood like what porn was, so that's fun. <laughs> right. I was just, yeah, I was just very naive. Um but yeah, I remember I watched it like a couple of times during him and I dating um, because like he watched it. And honestly, I was just 
like curious and then he had asked me to watch it with him one time and I was like oh okay and so yeah but like at that time I didn't really like I don't want to like struggle with it or anything like I didn't watch it like avidly or anything like I just watched it a couple times with him and then um he and him and I ended up breaking up after like a year um because essentially he was unfaithful and Mm -hmm. um yeah so um, during all of this, though, I started to get really, really sick in high school. Um, so I had gotten diagnosed with something called POTS syndrome my ninth grade year. Um, which, that? if you don't, I, yeah, I was going to say, I guess I should yeah. explain that because people a lot don't know what that is. Um, so it stands for postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. And so oh. the, Basic definition is like when you change positions, like your body just kind of freaks out, like your blood pressure doesn't adjust the way it should. And then like gravity kind of like pulls your blood down and it'll like pull in your legs and like it can cause you to like pass out and like get really dizzy um, and among like a bunch of other things. So it's technically an autonomic nervous system disorder. So basically people who have POTS like... um, whatever people who don't have POTS, like whatever their bodies do like naturally, like really well, like just automatically, someone with POTS, their body does not do it automatically. So like adjusting to, like their eyes adjusting to light and um, their body is adjusting to gravity and just all those different things. So um, I actually had to be like home bound taught. So that's basically like where a teacher comes to your house like once a week for like 45 minutes and teaches you all your school subjects and that's supposed to be like your education so (laughs) that's kind of crazy um but yeah so um and then in 11th grade i actually they said like pots should significantly like get better like with age and so um in 11th grade like my doctor was thinking it wasn't getting better. It was getting worse. And so he's like, I'm just going to test you for Lyme disease. I highly doubt you have it, but I'm just going to test you for it. And I came back positive for Lyme disease. And so, um, I started treatment for that. It made me very, like, it made me a lot sicker. Um, just because when you have Lyme and you are trying to get rid of Lyme, um, the bacteria does not like that that's in your body. And so (laughs) you'll get this thing yeah so you'll get this thing called like a herx reaction and basically your body just like or my body just kind of like freaked out and would like i would throw up or i would like pass out or i would get really dizzy or get really bad headaches or get really bad joint pain so i was kind of you know a hot mess (laughs) um and yeah, yeah during high school and early college so basically from like my ninth grade year to my sophomore year of college i had gotten diagnosed with like six different things like um pots and then lime and then i had gotten diagnosed with a thyroid um dysfunction um celiac food allergies hypoglycemia like all this different stuff my body was just not having it so um yeah that's a lot that's a so much to deal with i want to jump in here because i want to sort of uh, set the stage for people to understand what's happening to you. So you've got this this life without God that you're living. Uh, you're having yeah. afflictions come upon you. You've got some diseases being diagnosed over your body. You've run into issues with your uh, boyfriends and you've lost your virginity and he's trying to influence you and to get into situations you're not really familiar with and it's going to cause you to sort of stumble even further down the road. And so, and you've got your, your dad bringing you around the, the other woman and there's all these situations that are sort of happening in your life and they're all sort of culminating with you making these decisions decisions in regards to your sexual sin and your next relationship and even your 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 now husband's relationship when you guys first started to date so walk us through uh, what that looked like for you and how you were able to you know uh fall into these temptations yeah so basically i put my identity completely in men like especially like when i was not a christian um so after my first boyfriend and i broke up i just (laughs) lost it (laughs) like I was not doing well I was crying every day pretty much and I was just trying to get attention from guys wherever I could however I could um I wasn't I wasn't like sleeping around but I was definitely dating around a lot and like kissing a lot of different guys and just not living a fulfilling and fruitful life 
for Christ. And I just feel like I was always trying to fill a void that was meant to be filled with Jesus. And I was always trying to fill it with other things. And so um, in attempts to fill it with other things, I ended up starting to drink. Um, I only drank like three or four times, but it was always to get drunk. And it was always to just see how much I could drink and just to see if I could like drown out any of like the emotions and everything I was going through. So that was um, my senior year of high school that I started to do that. And that was during the time where I'm just letting all these guys just treat me basically like an object. Um, and so, yeah, I remember one specific night, um, I drank way too much and my so-called friend left me alone in my house because my parents were out of town. And I remember asking God, um, because I had started to, God started to put Christians in my life, like the very end of 2014. And I wasn't, I was, it was interested in God, but I wasn't exactly interested in turning from like my sinful ways and desires. So, but I remember, um, praying, um, for like the first time in probably years and asking God, like, if you spare my life, because I literally thought I was going to die. Because, of course, on top of all this, I have all these illnesses that, like, are completely right. being affected by me drinking. Right, right. So it was, like, very interesting. But um, not good at all. And so I told God, if you let me live, I will, like, never drink again. I will go to church. I will never drink again. <laughs> so <laughs> I was freaked out. And so, yeah, I think it was three days later. Um, I ended up being invited to a church service, um, and I had gone to one a couple weeks prior um, because I was invited, and I honestly did, wasn't really, I didn't even know it was a church service. I just thought it was like a little party thing. Oh, yeah. Um, you wouldn't have gone which probably, was, did, you know? <laughs> Yeah, if I would have known it was a full-blown church service, I don't think I would have gone. And even, I remember sitting in the parking lot for like 45 minutes, freaking out, being like, is this a church service? Like, am I, I felt like I knew a little bit, but I'm like, it's okay, I'm just gonna go in. Um, and then I ended up going um, a couple weeks later, and then that was like when I went the second time, that's when I got saved. So I ended up going up for the altar call, and the pastor said, you know, do you want to give your life to God? Um, or no, he, first he said, if you want to have a better 2015, um, then step forward to be prayed over. And I was like, okay, well, my 2014 was not it. So that's when I right. had dealt <laughs> my breakup, <laughs> diagnosed with Lyme disease. So I was like, yeah, I need a better 2015. That is for sure. So <laughs> I stepped forward and then he said, step forward again if you want to give your life to God. And I remember uh, there's just nothing that was holding me. I just stepped forward. And I am not in like, especially... I, I'm very much of like, I was like a follower. Like if somebody else wasn't going to step forward, like I wasn't going to, but I remember not even looking, which was completely out of my character at the time and just stepping forward and giving my life to God. And yeah, um, I was prayed over for healing and stuff, which is not when I got healed, but it was really awesome to like, know, like now I have hope for healing. I have a purpose. I have, you know, identity, like my identity and my values all can now come from Christ and like the Bible and Christianity and all that stuff. So that was really awesome. Yeah. Um, so yeah, literally though, three days later, I started dating somebody and he was not mm -hmm. a Christian. And um, I didn't really understand that that was a bad thing. Like, cause this guy right. was very like respectful and you know, mm -hmm. the worldly nice aspects, I guess. Yeah, he was like a nice guy. And so um, not someone I would have usually gone for at that time. And so I was mm -hmm. like, oh, this, this seems great. And so, um, yeah, I knew that it was against the Bible to not have sex. Like, I knew that that was something that I shouldn't be doing. And um, I remember telling him, well, I'm just going to ignore that. <laughs> and <laughs> we can have sex. And, yeah. So, um, I remember, so, him and I had sex. Um, and it was, like, three months into our relationship. And very, very quickly, God was like, nope and so um <laughs> i started to get really depressed and really just so convicted like so so convicted and i told that i remember we were sitting in the starbucks parking lot and i was just sitting there like really nervous because i was like i have to tell him like i cannot have sex with him anymore mm -hmm. um because i was just getting 
very distraught every time we yeah. have it. So I told him I can't have sex anymore. I don't fully understand why, but I think it's because of God yeah. um, convicting me. And because I was only a Christian for like three months at that point. So I wasn't even sure like what conviction full blown looked like, but that was definitely it. Um, so he um, was totally supportive, said he was like, oh, totally fine with it, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, great. And about two months into our like not having sex life, which we still stumbled. Well, I should say I stumbled because he wasn't really actively trying not to have it like I was. Um, and I feel like if you're watching this, you and your significant other need to be on the same page because mm -hmm. not having sex before marriage, as hard as it is, and if you're on the same page and if you're not on the same page, it's just like a hundred times harder. So yeah, just a little wisdom. But, yeah. We need some um, Yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah. So anyway, I ended up finding porn on his phone a couple months later. And I remember that just completely, like, wrecking me. And I was like, oh, my gosh, am I not good enough? Like, why is he looking at porn? Blah, blah, blah. And so I confronted him about it, and I said, I don't think that this is something that we should be doing. I don't think it's something that you should be doing. Um, in that time, he got, like, fake saved. Um, he, like, acted like he was – he came to Christ um, during that time because he thought I would break up with him if he didn't. And so – yeah um so that's some manipulation like, there that's crazy town yeah and so and he was very convincing like he would actually like pray and like worship with his hands raised and everything so it was kind of crazy um and so i said like as christians we shouldn't be watching porn like i know that this and i don't think i fully understood it at that time but i knew that we just shouldn't be doing it i that's mm -hmm. all i knew i was like i just feel like this is not of the lord we shouldn't be doing this and so he's like yeah, 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 I'll stop watching it. I'm really, really sorry. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. So I forgave him. And then a couple months later, um, he actually ended up moving into my house. So <laughs> he had a um, very, very toxic family situation. Mm -hmm. His dad was addicted to heroin. And um, the SWAT team ended up coming to his house yeah, it was really bad. His dad had a, like a lot of warrants out for his arrest and it was super, super bad. And so I was always really worried. Like one time yeah. him and I went on a date and there was a heroin needle like underneath mm -hmm. the seat of the car because yeah. it was his dad's car. And so he didn't do any of that stuff, though. He was extremely against like drinking and drugs and just all of it because his dad was an addict. So um, and he knew it ran in the family. So anyway, yeah, he was like feeling very unsafe and he ended up moving in with me and with like my family and so um right after he moves in with me I remember God speaking to me you need to break up with him mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was like no like there's no way I need to break up with him we just like he just moved in like everything's going great like he stopped watching porn like yeah. we're growing I thought we were growing closer to the yep. Lord together yeah um and so anyway he a month later I get this message from this person I went to high school with and she goes, I just want you to know that I'm on this dating app and that your boyfriend has a profile. And mm -hmm. I'm like, no way. Like, there's no way. And I'm like, it's old, whatever. And so I was like, okay. And so I was like, can you send me like screenshots and like a link to it? So she sends me everything and it was not old. It was very recent. And he was asking girls for nudes to like do like sexual calls with him, all of this really terrible stuff while he's living with me. So I don't know how that was happening. That's don't even want to know at this point. Um, yeah. And yeah, so I find this profile and I was like, holy crap. And I just remember like, oh, just feeling so terrible because this was like, I thought this was it. Like this was yeah. my husband. Like he was a Christian, like all this stuff. So I confront him and he admits that he's been addicted to pornography since he was like really young. I think it was like eight years old or something. Mm. And um, so, yeah, that was like really heartbreaking because the whole time we were dating, he was addicted and like it was just, it was a God thing that I found all of it. I'm very yeah. grateful. And so, how did this that become did. influence in your life? How did this become part of what you were looking at? Yeah. So, 
Um, yeah, so we ended up breaking up and um, because of all of that stuff. And I realized because our relationship was like so special to both of us, like him and I were like really close friends beforehand for a while. I was like, wow, porn is no joke. Like he knew that cheating on me in this way um, would break us up. Like he knew that if he were to watch porn and if he were to do these things like on this app that we would break up, like if I found it. And so clearly like this is a huge issue. And so um, I was definitely very like broken during that time. And I started to watch porn a bit after that. And so I felt disgusting. I knew I, w I should not be watching it, but I'm, I don't even know why I watched it. I know people that um, watch my video on finding freedom from sexual sin and pornography. They're like, well, why'd you start watching it? I couldn't, I literally just couldn't tell you. Um, <laughs> so I had started watching it and, um, but during that time, I had only watched it like a couple of times. And then I had found this website called Fight the New Drug and it was basically which i just highly recommend everybody to go to this even if like they're not a christian because it's really so scary the effects of pornography in so many different ways like pornography is not just watching people on a screen so i feel like between him ruining our relationship basically for the sake of pornography and then um me watching it and then seeing how like I mean, I didn't get addicted to it necessarily, but I was like, wow, I could see how this would be like very mind altering just because of the way that sex is portrayed on pornography. And then I start educating myself on how porn is addict or porn is linked to sex trafficking. Porn is linked to um, just all these horrible things like, you know, child pornography, all these things that are obviously terrible, even if you're not a Christian, like, 99.9% .9 of people do not want to see people being trafficked or anything. And one of the things that really jumped out to me was that porn teaches um, men and women how to have violent sex and like how to normalize abuse during sex. And when I read that, I remember just sitting there kind of like something just like hit me in the face. Like it was crazy because I'm sitting there and I'm like, wow, that is exactly how my two past boyfriends were like they would like hit me during sex and like they always asked like oh is this okay i saw like or like one of them said i saw it on porn the other one was just like oh yeah like i've wanted to try this or whatever and they would ask me to do other things that were clearly just not something that you would just think of on your own like it was clearly like a perverse idea to do mm -hmm. um and yeah so I realized that basically I was my mind in every way I have had, have had sex was basically lustful and you know violent in a lot of ways and just not good. Basically porn taught my exes how to have sex and then in turn that ended up affecting like the way I viewed sex in my own brain and then like my sex life and just yeah. all of it. Yeah. So uh... um a lot to take in. Let me stop you right there for a second because I want to jump ahead a little yes. bit. So you, you you have the pornography uh, in your boyfriend's lives and that trickles out and it becomes a habit in your life. It ultimately leads you to becoming passionate about sort of pornography as a sin issue. God's convicting you. You're trying to walk this out. Yes. You find who is now your husband, James, and you guys uh, aren't able to stay uh, pure right away. But you guys have this tremendous video where you talk about how you went a period of time mm -hmm. having sex and then you decided to stop having sex until you got married. And that is a tremendous story in and of itself, you know, in that uh, passion temptation, especially for people who are about to get married and, you know, you were already done it. And like for you guys to sort of say no to that, I think that might be able to speak to some of the people who are watching this video. So I want you to sort of walk us through what that looked like for you guys. Yeah. Okay. So when James and I first started dating, um, I don't even know how to start this. So James, um, right before we started dating, um, he knew why my ex and I broke up. He was actually friends with my ex. And, um, so he knew that I was like very scared of like my future, like partner watching porn and just everything happening again. Um, so yeah, he ended up telling me his testimony about finding freedom from pornography and just all of it. And it was very genuine. I could just tell his faith was very genuine. He grew up a Christian. He grew up in the church. Um, and so, yeah. So um, he and I, when we first started dating, so he grew up in a very 
very conservative Christian home. So, um, you know, his sister and her um, now husband, but her boyfriend at the time, would have, like, chaperone dates and, like, everything oh, yeah. like that. Duggar style. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yes. So, um, entering into that was, like, very... Um, scary because i was like i've never even set boundaries with a guy really because i just didn't even right. yeah it just Wasn't i've never been in a true christian relationship so um yeah so anyway so him and i got into our relationship and we did not set boundaries and it was just it was a habit for me if i fell in love with someone or if i really liked someone to like have sex with them like you know every other boyfriend I had had I had sex with um like my serious relationships I had sex with so it was just something that I just it was like very like natural to me um you know, the bible says to you know deny our flesh so uh we did not at the beginning we didn't set boundaries which I really think is what where we went wrong with everything um I we didn't know what was too strict or what was too not strict. Like we just weren't really sure. We had we had very very loose 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 boundaries, mm -hmm. and so um, I'm like, oh, like that's fine as long as we don't do that. But we weren't setting ourselves up for success to like, you know, not get to that point. So, right. um, yeah. So we ended up falling into sexual sin. How many months into our relationship? That was probably like six months into our relationship. Um, we fell into sexual sin and I actually took my husband's virginity and yeah, we felt really, really, really bad and just really convicted. And, um, yeah, so basically we just kept falling into sin. Um, I mean, it just, we tried not to, obviously we did not try hard enough not to, we still didn't right. have like very strict boundaries. We would try to like firm up our boundaries, but it was just very difficult for us. We just fell into sin um, numerous times with um, having sex and stuff. And so finally, um, the beginning of 2017, I had ended up getting extremely sick. Um, like all of my conditions started to just like flare up and I was in and out of the hospital a bunch. Yep, that was us raining in the new year, I think, <laughs> in the <laughs> hospital. And that was real fun. <laughs> Not at all. But <laughs> I remember um, kind of just taking inventory of my entire life at that point and being like, because I remember thinking to myself, why is God letting this happen to me? Right. Am I doing something wrong? Which is not like the right way of thinking. But hey, it led me to like getting more pure. So that was good. I guess if something good came out of it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I was really, really sick. And so. Um, um, we ended up stopping having sex at the very beginning of that year, um, and we set new boundaries in place, and we, um, yeah, we just really stuck to them. I mean, I'm not going to say we were, like, a thousand percent perfect. Like, there was definitely times that we went further than we wanted to, but um, we didn't go as far as to really, like, have sex for two whole years before we were married. So that was really good. Um, but him and I, I'm trying to think. Well, let me stop you there then. So I want to talk yes, about that because it, it, you gloss over it. You said, well, for two years we didn't have sex. Like that is a big deal for married Christians who are like, we hear about people getting married so fast and you guys were able to put the brakes on. And even you said you weren't perfect, but you put the brakes on essentially. And you said, okay, we're going to put yeah. boundaries in place. Walk us through what those kind of boundaries look like. Cause that might be an issue for people out there and they might need some help in that area. Yes, for sure. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. So we wouldn't make out anymore. We would like only kiss very like like we would like peck but very infrequently so i don't think that's a bad thing like i think we would both say to people if we could go back that we would have even had stricter boundaries um i don't think that even like holding if you don't even like want to hold hands before marriage if that's something that tempts you like don't let that make you feel weird because i feel like once you get married you're so much more grateful for how strict your boundaries were when you were not married um so yeah, we didn't really kiss except for like pecking. We didn't cuddle. We didn't lay in the same bed, even if it was just like to watch TV or something. Um, a lot of the time we, 
Well, we ended up adopting a dog. So <laughs> together when we weren't even married. So that was fun. <laughs> um, no, she's, she's amazing. Like it's a great decision, but she literally, this sounds like so funny, but God literally used our dog because she, if she even heard us just kiss, she would come between us. Like, just straight up, just come between us. So um, she never let us get close. And I think that was great. So uh, honestly, we attribute her to a lot of our yeah. success for our purity because she would just get right in between us. So usually on the couch, like she'd just be between us. Like if we were like, you know, playing a video game or like watching TV or something. Yeah. So, you know, keeping space between us though, if you don't have a dog, that is, we called her like our little purity officer. So, oh, um, you know, if you don't. <laughs> So if you don't have a dog, just, you know, keeping space between you guys, um, you know, uh, for like obvious things, we didn't have any form of sex because in my opinion, I don't know if this is like too crude to say, but like oral sex is sex. Um, I think anything further than kissing when you are a Christian, I don't think that it's honoring to the Lord. And I think that was something that we were very convicted of. So we just didn't let it go farther than kissing. Um, you know, 99% of the time. Yeah. Um, like, that's why I say we, we weren't a thousand percent perfect. There are probably times where we did like, let it go a bit further than kissing, but we didn't let like each other touch each other, you know, in the areas that you wouldn't want to before marriage. So, um, yeah, I mean, really we just didn't have a ton of physical contact. And yeah. I think that, um, for me, like I grew up, like you know, in relationships where I, like, I'm a very physical touch person. I'm like a hugger, which like, that's why COVID's been so hard. Cause I'm like a <laughs> hugger. Like I'm just go hug people all the time. And so, um, yeah, it was really difficult, um, for me a little bit just because I'm like, that's how I would like show love is yeah. like, I would be more like physical, like physical affection, um, especially like with my significant other. Um, but we just really limited that. And I think that that really did take our relationship to like another level, um, because we actually got to know each other. Like, I mean, like we obviously already knew each other, but we got to know each other on like a deeper and different level by not doing pretty much anything physical for like the two years before we dated, like, or before we got married, because even like when we did our engagement photos, um, our photographer told us to like kiss during the photos. And I remember that being slightly awkward, like, <laughs> We're like, yeah. oh, okay. And it just felt like so much kissing because, and it probably really wasn't, and obviously nothing would happen like in the middle of a field. Photographer was, but I just remember that being like so weird because I'm like, oh, like we just don't really kiss anymore. And right. yeah, so that's, well, that's probably- part of your lifestyle now. Yeah. And I appreciate yeah. that for, uh, for me, I was of the world before, uh, I got born again at 29 years old and I had had sex and my wife and I, uh, when I met her, uh, in 2013, she was a virgin and we decided to stay pure until she was married until she was married to me. And so, uh, it was a, uh, a road that I hadn't traveled before. And so I had to learn like you did, you know, what, what does it look like to set boundaries and what is it like to date a Christian? And like, I was a Christian, but I was a baby Christian when we met. And so it's like, what does this yeah, look like? It's, it's weird, weird to go on group dates. Like our first date was a group date. And I was like, what is it? Other people got to come. <laughs> like I didn't get it, but those, but those things really do help. They help, uh, couples, they help men and women both, uh, stay in the lane that God wants you to stay in. I think all sex is sex before marriage. And we got to be able to say, okay, yeah. You know, how are we keeping ourselves to the Lord? And so I love your story. And, you know, obviously we saw the picture that, you know, you guys finally got married. Uh, and I love this picture, your wedding picture, but in, in the midst of you, you know, going through this, you were also born again, you're baptized and you're set on fire for the Lord. And now you and your husband are on a mission real and redeemed with James and Kristen, where you guys are trying to help people who are facing these kinds of issues and by sharing your testimony and doing other things. So walk us through what it looks like for you guys now that you're in a place where you're using your testimony to help other people. Yes. Okay. So yeah, we started our YouTube channel in 2018. Um, I think you have a picture of our first ever thumbnail, which is a little embarrassing, yeah. but it's okay. Where is that at? <laughs> um, <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's basically just us with a stuffed animal. Like, I don't even know what we're doing. Um, oh, this is <laughs> This is your first YouTube thumbnail here, yeah. Here's your yeah, face. <laughs> oh yeah, there's the there's that beauty. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we actually so we came across a YouTube channel um, where we felt like they were very judgmental, and I was like, and they were Christians, and I was like, oh my gosh, James, like this really like 
actually hurts my soul because I feel like these people are like perpetuating Christianity in a way that it's really like not. And so I was like, we need to make videos like this, but like really come from a perspective of like, and like a heart of love and grace and just sharing our story because like nobody's perfect and um, God can redeem literally anything. And like, that's what we've learned so much in our lives. And um, just, we keep learning that even. So um, we started our YouTube channel um, not knowing how to edit. We did literally no idea what we were doing. Um, <laughs> uh, I just remember like asking my brother-in-law, what do I use to edit my videos? And he just <laughs> yeah. said this random software. So my mom was really gracious and she bought it for us because she believed in us and everything. So that was awesome. Um, but yeah, so we started making YouTube videos and then really just, um, I ended up sharing my testimony of overcoming sexual sin and pornography, and um, it kind of t took off. Um, so yeah. it has almost 250,000 views on our channel, um, which we're a little bit smaller of a channel. We have less than 3,000 subscribers right now, but we're grateful for every single one because yeah. each one's from the Lord and they're there for a reason. Um, but yeah, so I remember it was... Um, we prayed, like, God, blow up our YouTube channel before we get married, and he did. Um, and so we were able to start um, monetizing our videos, which is basically, you know, you just play ads on your videos, because um, we were able to get enough watch time and everything once that video blew up. And it blew up right before our wedding, and so it was really, really crazy. Um, all the stories and the testimonies that I've seen people share on that specific video of me overcoming porn and sexual sin. Um, people have just shared like a bunch of stuff and just said that how much it's blessed them. And that's been such a blessing for me because I was just, I mean, even that video of the editing was just not it, but, <laughs> but the Lord used it. It's okay. Yeah. He's still using it. So it's great. Um, but like, I remember being so nervous to share that because that was something that Satan really used as like a kind of like you're not good enough. Why would you mm -hmm. even go into ministry type of thing and blah, blah, blah. Because in um, 2016, at the very end, or no, it was at the beginning. It was, oh no, it was at the end of 2015 where I felt called to ministry. Um, and yeah, I mean, God uses, but like God uses each and every one of our stories. So for his glory. And so to be able to like make a YouTube ministry and just be doing this is like super awesome because yeah, just we, sh yeah, obviously I shared that James shared his story with pornography. Um, and then, um, uh, we've shared our like sexual sin struggle before we got married with each other, which was a really good thing to share. That was also really hard to share. Um, sure. you know, we just really try to be like led by the spirit and like not worry about like how, you know, like hate comments or like how it could have, like how it could negatively impact people, but like how the Lord like wants to use it because mm -hmm. like Satan can use anything and like to instill fear into us, you know, the fear of hate, the fear of not being liked, the fear of being rejected. Um, that's definitely something that James and I have both dealt with as being people pleasers, but you know, we just try to like share as much as we can and just like what God's doing, what God's done in our life sure. in a hopefully a very real way so that people are encouraged and don't feel like condemned or like, you know, of course you're going to upset people because it's just the nature of sharing God's word. Some people just get offended yeah. by it. Um, but yeah, we've definitely shared a lot. Like I've shared um, my journey kind of like with modesty, um, how I don't like wear bikinis anymore. So we've just tried to share honestly as much as we can and like where we're coming from with it, what like God's done in our hearts about it and just in hopes that other people will just relate and maybe even, you know, feel encouraged and find freedom through our stories too. So, yeah, I think your channel is very real. It's authentic. I love that you and your husband are so open and honest about your past struggles and also your hopes for each other and also your hopes for other people. And you're all doing that from a biblical background. And I really appreciate that about your videos. Uh, I think, you know, one of the reasons that, you know, your big video blew up is that the idea that there are women who deal with pornography issues and no one's talking about it. It seems like every guy in church will walk to the front and share that they have an addiction with it, but all the women sit there. And it's like, there are, there's probably way more women who are dealing with this than we'll ever know. And so it's such an honest, 
real testimony that you're sharing that you even had this habit you know that you were looking at things you shouldn't be looking at that is a blessing to people and so god calls you into ministry you and your husband are being real and authentic on your podcast and your youtube channel and so you guys were in michigan but you guys decided to come to oklahoma to be part of a ministry down here tell us about that yes okay so um whew. okay so this can kind of go along with my healing testimony so we, I ended up getting called to go to ORU, um, which is a, ch uh, not a church, wow, a college here in Tulsa. And wow. so um, that was in 2017, but that's also when I was having a lot of health issues. Um, I did try to go to um, ORU still, even through the health issues, but I ended up having to come home just because I was, I was just not able to go to classes and it was really difficult. So, um, Anyway, so the next year after that, I ended up watching a sermon from a church that was right near um, ORU. And I would have never known about this church had I not gone to ORU because I, I feel like I really questioned, like, God, why did you allow me to even go to ORU? And like, basically, like, I felt like I failed, you know, like, why would you let me do this and like call me here? And then I fail and I had to come home. But um, yeah, James and I started watching these like YouTube videos from, or these sermons from this church down here that we would have, again, never known about if I hadn't gone to ORU. And I ended up getting supernaturally healed through, not through the sermon, but during the sermon um, through Jesus. So that was incredible. Like so yeah. amazing. Literally like seven years of sickness just gone in Jesus name. So yeah, it's uh, it's literally amazing. So yeah, I have that, that feel and for someone who had been dealing with everything and like, what was that like for you to get a supernatural healing? You, well, we can't just stop there. We have to expound on that a little bit more to encourage people who are like, God doesn't heal today. No, what He heals you. Let's talk about it. Yes, God does heal today in yeah. Jesus' name. And um, yeah, so basically, like they were just praying at the end of the um, the sermon. It was a really good sermon. Um, it was called The Winds Are About to Change in Your Life, and it was um, by Pastor Paul Doherty. And so, um, yeah, they were praying at the end, and I got down on my knees. James was down on his knees, and I just literally saw, like, sickness leave my body. Like, the words pots and lime, just, like, I saw them, like, leaving my body and going into the hand of Jesus, and he just grabbed them, and they were gone, and I knew I was healed. And yeah. I was like, oh my gosh. And so I didn't say anything to James because I was just kind of sitting there like processing, like just soaking it in really. And uh, then James like walked into my kitchen because we weren't married at the time. This was like the year before we got married. It was like a few months after we got engaged and we were just like watching. Um, yeah, we were actually watching a sermon from home and it was a Sunday morning because I had a headache that day and I had headaches a lot in the mornings. So um, yeah, God can use like literally any, you know, you can get healed. It doesn't have to be like through an altar call at a church. Like mine was just literally, I was listening to a church online. So let that encourage you as well. Yeah. Um, because I know, if, you know, if you're sick, sometimes it is really hard to make it to church and stuff. So yeah. So then he was like, um, he like looked at me and then I was like, looking at him and he was, I was like, I got healed. He goes, yeah, I know. I'm like, what do you mean you know? And he's like, yeah, God told me when you were getting healed. And I was like, oh, oh my gosh. Amazing. So yeah. Yeah, it was really awesome. And so, yeah, it's really been a journey because, you know, when you're sick for that long, like you just learn to do things as a sick person. So right. um, when I would go on flights, I would, a lot of the time I would get really sick. And so we flew for our honeymoon, which was the first time flying after getting healed. I had like three hours of sleep. I was like, I didn't drink that much water, um, which I would really, really easily get dehydrated when I had pots and lime. Um, but literally and like the lack of sleep would have just if i would have still been sick i would have been extremely not feeling good on that flight um yeah. and i remember blacking out on a flight that i had went on like a couple years prior when i was sick so um we went on our honeymoon flight and i had absolutely like no health issues which is obvious because i was healed but i think you know my subconsciously I'm like bracing myself a bit because I'm like, okay, like I'm on a flight. I've had three hours of sleep and then like nothing was happening. Like nothing bad was happening. So I was like, wow, this is so great. And I remember just like thanking God, like every time like a situation like that would happen that would have made me sick in the past. Um, I'm like, oh my gosh, thank you, God. Like it was just like a testimony after testimony of like God's healing and God's provision in that. So yeah, it's been really great. I've been able to actually like work out again and um yeah and literally just live 
um a pretty normal life now so it's yeah. been uh, one, so one where awesome. you had to move across the country though so to start your ministry yes yes so that's how so right after i got healed um james it was like a month later or something he can't, comes home from work or he comes back to my apartment from work or something and he goes um i feel like we need to move to tulsa and i was just like we what <laughs> <laughs> and so he's like i think we need to move to tulsa i'm like okay um i go all right when our youtube channel takes off like when we're making full-time livable income we'll move to tulsa like you know kind of putting a cap on basically like what god was speaking to him and mm -hmm. uh, which was not right but i think you know in the in your mind and in, in like the worldly view and you're just like oh like logically we would I'll wait until we had a faith full after something comes in first <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, like, you know, a lot of people don't just move without a job, which, hey, we did. So, <laughs> so yeah. So, basically, um, then God, like, a few weeks later was like, yeah, you're moving to Tulsa. I was like, okay. We didn't know when. Um, and we actually have a video that we just came out with, like, a few weeks ago talking about God's timing and, like, how he worked all the timing for good for our move because – um, my sister-in-law actually ended up going through a really hard pregnancy and um, she ended up like by the grace of God, a miracle, having a one pound, 10 ounce baby. And um, he was in the NICU for like two months and um, he ended up being able to come home and we were able to help her with the baby and we would have never been able to do that and be here for her if we had gone, um, you know, any earlier. So it was just like perfect timing when we ended up going. But anyway, yeah. So, um, this past summer or no, it's not this past spring, like when quarantine and everything started happening, James and I really felt like God was really preparing us. Like God, it was soon that we were supposed to be going to Tulsa and actually moving. And so we ended up going down here in August and, um, viewing like apartments and like doing all that kind of stuff. And, um, God literally just made a way and, um, you know, we don't have full-time livable income jobs and we don't have Tulsa employment and we don't make three times rent, which is really usually how you would get, um, approved. But by the grace of God, we were able to get approved, um, for this apartment we're living in right now. And it was just amazing. And so literally it's just so many God provisions throughout that entire mm -hmm. thing. But yeah, so we moved down here and really with the hopes of doing YouTube and podcasting and just everything like full time. And so um, right now we're not making full time income on our YouTube and our podcast and stuff, but we're believing in God that we will be making it. And so we yeah. took the step of faith and finances and just literally everything. James quit his full time job. I quit my job. Um, you know, James was in the family business being set up basically to take it over and he gave up that opportunity completely. And so we're really just trusting in God. And so basically, um, we're down here and just really trying to pursue, um, just everything with like YouTube and podcasting yeah. and everything. And then we're involved in like a local church and, um, there's this place called the Tulsa Dream Center and they have been giving out groceries to people every single week since um, the pandemic hit and um, just being able to pray for people, seeing miracles break out. And so we really want to be a part of that. We haven't, we just moved here like a few weeks ago. So, I mean, it's almost been a month actually, which is crazy. Uh -huh. um, so we are actually in the process of like starting to see where we want to volunteer, see where they want us to volunteer and all that kind of stuff. So we're in contact with the church and everything and just with like the organization and stuff. So we really want to like just really serve people while we're down here. And also I feel like God is letting us, you know, there's so many things God's doing in this season, but I feel like letting us not be around like hardly anything that we know so that we can really get alone with him and really focus in on growing this stuff. And yeah. then, you know, serving people in our community, you know, we were from like a pretty small town back in Michigan. So to be living in Tulsa is like such a unique and amazing opportunity you know there's so much diversity here there's just so much to glean and learn from like leaders here and just yeah so we're really excited and we think that this will really help us not only in you know youtube ministry but eventually you know james wants to um start speaking places i want to start speaking places and um you know he is currently writing like a devotional and stuff like that so just really just we're basically just pouring everything that we can into this and praying that the Lord just blesses and multiplies it so that we yeah. can have a full-time ministry 
profession, well, basically. I'll, so I'll, yeah, I'll stay in an agreement with you on that one. And I'll encourage anybody who's watching this video to head over to their YouTube page, James and Kristen, uh, search for them real and redeem podcast. You can also go get that anywhere you get podcasts, Apple podcast, Google play. I'm sure it's available all those places. If you're watching this video on our YouTube channel, the links will be in the description. Uh, I want to thank you for joining us on the show today. Your, your story is so awesome. There's so many layers of it. And I really appreciate you sharing all that with us today. Yes, thank you so much for having me. And I'm just really grateful um, for this opportunity and for how the Lord is going to use this and just use all of your content. So that's awesome. <laughs> wow, what an incredible testimony from Kristen. I mean, really, she has gone through a number of different issues in her life from having uh, father issues and childhood issues and family issues and then it turned into boyfriend issues and sexual sin issues and then even crept into her life uh those those sin issues continued even after she was born again because when we get born again it's a process it's a process of daily conversation and relationship with god where he begins to convict us of our sins kristen talked about that kristen talked about feeling that conviction for the first time and Oftentimes it led her to a point where she's at Starbucks going, okay, we got to quit this. But also times there was, she fell off and she wasn't able to do the things she wanted. She wasn't perfect were the words that she used. And so we know that when God comes into our life, the Holy Spirit begins to convict us of our sins, begins to right the wrongs that we've been doing in our life. And it's a process. It's a journey in our relationship with Jesus. When I got born again, I didn't stop gambling overnight. No, it was a, it was a process for me to be delivered of that addiction. And for anyone who's facing any trial, any sin issue, whatever it is, it doesn't always clear up that night. Sometimes it does and praise God when it does. And we don't always get healed at that, at that healing service, but praise God when it does, as she said, you can get healed in your own living room, watching TV. Isn't that an amazing God that we love? Let's pray for any Anybody today who's been blessed by this testimony. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the people who have tuned in today. We pray for the people who have had childhoods that weren't ideal, childhoods that did not have you in them. They were not raised in God. Lord, we pray for the children and the adults and the teenagers who are raised in those environments that you would find a way, Lord Jesus, that you know how to speak to their hearts in a way that they would hear your voice and the voice of a stranger they would not follow, that you would tear off the stones walls in their heart and you would make them a heart of flesh lord jesus they would see the veil torn from their eyes that they would recognize who god is that they would realize that jesus christ died for them and they would be born again because of their faith and trust in him we also want to pray for anybody who's dealing with sexual sin issues, whether you're not able to uh, keep it together when you're in a room with your loved one, uh, your, your, your significant other rather, and you want to be able to uh, deny your flesh, as Kristen said. So we want to pray for the people to have the courage, the boldness, and the strength, Lord, it's hard sometimes to deny your flesh when you really want to do something. And so pray that you would give those people wisdom to set boundaries, that they would be able to walk in a way that honors you. In the, in the life that you've given us and the bodies you've given us and put us in a position to put ourselves where those things are allowable. When you get married, when you're with the one you're equally yoked with, these opportunities are now available without sin issues being part of the problem. So we want to pray for those people. We want to pray for anybody, men or women who are dealing with pornography issues. We pray that you would be able to put the phones away, put the blockers on, get an accountability partner. We pray that God would answer your prayers to stop looking at those things, to stop touching yourself where you don't want to be, <laughs> you wouldn't want anybody to walk in while you're doing that stuff. So we want to pray for those people that they would find uh, not shame or guilt, but they would find confidence in knowing that their Lord can help them run away from those things in their life when they can be set free and delivered from those. So we pray that God would deliver you from the things that struggle in your heart, the lust of your eye, the lust of the flesh. We pray that they would be broken and the bondage will be gone in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for joining us on today's deep dive into the life of Kristen and her husband, James. I really appreciate their ministry. Don't forget to go check it out, Real and Redeemed Podcast, or you can find James and Kristen over on YouTube. And if you've been a blessed by this testimony today, we encourage you to head over to our YouTube channel. You can subscribe to our channel, Testimony House. You can also uh, find us on line at testimonyhouse.org. You can subscribe to be our email list. You get first access to videos that we put out. We hope that if you're there and you like what you've seen and you want to partner with us as we create a hundred testimonial videos in 2021, that you would click that give tab and become a monthly supporter or a one-time gift giver. And this allows us to continue making the things that we do behind the scenes, including books and resources. We have a number of different projects we work on. We do addiction support recovery, and we're also trying to work on a, on a gambling documentary. And so there's all sorts of things going on behind the scenes here. If you want to be uh, sow some seeds into that, we would appreciate that very much. We want to thank you for joining us today. If you have a testimony and you want to share it with us, don't forget to email us info at testimonyhouse.org. You can be the next person in the seat for Tell Me Your Story. Until next time, guys, we pray you discover a future and a hope.
for your life today. We ain't trying to blend in. If you're ready, come on with us, my friends. Come on. We can change the world. Hey, hey, we can change the world. Let's go. What changes the world? The only thing that ever really changes the world is when somebody gets the idea that love can abound and can be shared.